Well, let's get started tonight. I, I have had a little internal battle going on over the last, I would say, four or five days in regards to what I wanted to do tonight, and I'll tell you why I wrestled this out. It should be straightforward in that we are in the Sermon on the Mount, so there's really no, it's not difficult. It's only three chapters of Matthew. We're not going sequentially, so it's basically pick a spot. You can land anywhere in those three chapters and you're dealing with the Sermon on the Mount. However, I'm in the Beatitudes portion and we haven't exhausted that. In fact, we barely even started. There's a lot we haven't said about the Beatitudes. So I really, that wasn't the debate. I know where we need to be. The debate is, this is our final meeting before Christmas. And I've been doing Christmas themed sermons, whether it be in Chapin or here, or the one I just shot for our online audience for this next weekend. And thinking along Advent Christmas lines, the whole waiting, anticipating the arrival of Jesus. And I just, my debate was I want to stay with the Sermon on the Mount because I'm just into it. We're just getting up off the ground with it. But I have this real desire to explore at least one more of the themes that we talk about annually going into Christmas. And I wanted it to be, I, I wanted those two things to coalesce. And so I was, how do we do that? How do we, how do we land there? And ask and you shall receive. I mean, the Father gives us these beautiful moments in the Word if we'll watch for them. And I started thinking about the revolutionary aspect to the Sermon on the Mount. The fact that Jesus delivers this message and it doesn't go down easy. It really doesn't. There's moments of this message that we struggle with because it, it seems like a big ask. Everything from how, your enemies, how you treat your enemies to the people that persecute you and what to do with the poor and what to do with the marginalized. And it, it, it gets, it's not, it's not fun. <laughs> and you think if you're gonna hear from Jesus, you would want this, you know, you want it to be fun. And I was going to say you want it to be life-giving. The reality is, is what he's saying is life-giving. It's just that our lives have become so closely attached to the system of the world that sometimes the Sermon on the Mount seems like it's pulling us in ways that we don't want to acknowledge. So we've spent a couple of weeks setting it up. We got into the Beatitudes and we've talked about how that is really blissful. And blissful are the poor, blissful are those that mourn, blissful are those, etc., etc., etc. And it's really not Jesus saying live up to, but Jesus saying, My Father lives out of these. My Father looks at the poor in spirit first. He looks at the mournful. He looks at those who need comfort, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And how we walk away from that and we go do something with it. Where is, does Jesus get this revolutionary attitude? Where did he learn it? He didn't go to college. He didn't go to set in seminary school. He, didn't, he wasn't raised at the feet of the Pharisees. He didn't spend his time with the scribes. We do see him consulting the doctors and the lawyers at age 12 in the temple, but we're to believe that's a one and done. That's an anomaly in the life of Jesus. That's not an everyday occurrence. It's not as if he spends a portion of his childhood or he apprentices in the temple or with a doctor or with a lawyer. It's shocking enough that a man in the first century would even know how to read. And yet we know he does because in Luke 4 he reads from the scroll of Isaiah 61. So he's educated. But we have no reason to believe that he has been educated in the schools of the revolutionaries or any of those things. And yet what comes out of Jesus' mouth is different than what was coming out of anyone else's mouth. To the point that later in his ministry they would say of him, Who is this man? He speaks as no one else speaks. He doesn't speak like the scribes. He speaks as a man with authority. In other words, there's a power behind his words. When he says that we believe it, there's some punch behind what this man has to say. And what this man has to say, if we line that up with the Hebrews' description of the Word of God, would have been sharp like a two-edged sword that come out of his mouth. Which means it kind of cuts away at the things in our lives. And the Sermon on the Mount most certainly does that. So... What in the world does that have to do with Advent? What's that have to do with the birth of Christ? Well, honestly, nothing. Until you consider that maybe Jesus learned this at home. Maybe 
He learned it from his mom. I want to explore tonight the famous Magnificat, a portion of Scripture, Mary's Magnificat, also called by Protestants the Song of Mary. Mary's Magnificat is the song that she sings when she finds out that she's having this baby that will be the savior of the world. And it's been the subject of many of our praise songs or our worship hymns in the church for a couple of thousand years is this Magnificat, the Latin word meaning magnify. She magnifies the Lord. Bonhoeffer called it the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung. Let's read a few verses. Luke chapter 1, verse 46, as we talk about the Magnificat on the Mount. I know there is no Magnificat on the Mount in the Bible. There's a Sermon on the Mount, and there's Mary's Magnificat. But I want to bring them together because I think it is appropriate. Mary sings this. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has looked with favor on the lowliness of His servant. Surely from now on... All generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And it's upward, and it's upbeat, and it's happy, and it's from a sort of servant's mentality, and it's her saying how good God is, it's her glorifying God, it's, why, it's her magnifying God, that's why we call it the Magnificat, because it's the magnification of God from this woman who bears in her womb the Son of God. And it's largely unpreached in the Protestant church to the point that we don't really even know what it means. Now, I got some theories on why that is. I want to share something with you first before I jump into that. And that's a little set of statistics. The Washington Post asked 1,000 evangelicals about the Magnificat. 28% had never heard it called that. 43% said their churches never read it or discuss it. By the way, we're now up to 70 plus percent in the church. We, we're, well over, we're about three-fourths of the church see I've never heard of it or we don't ever talk about it. 21% said they had encountered it a few times and 8% of evangelicals said that they've read it every year. 8% read it every year. Now, that re honestly guys, these statistics don't matter. I realize that. Nothing about your salvation is in any way affected or whether or not you call it the Magnificat, you've ever read it, you've ever heard of it, you've ever used it. Won't affect whether you go to heaven, it won't affect whether you're justified or whether you're forgiven, but it might have to do with why the Sermon on the Mount doesn't go down easy or why we're still fighting in the Protestant church over what the Sermon on the Mount was about or why we can't seem to land on what Jesus is trying to get us to do. And maybe it's because we've missed the context of what Jesus was trying to say. It's so controversial that in some countries like India, Guatemala, Argentina, they've banned the Magnificat from the liturgy and from public. So literally, they don't sing it or read it or use it in public settings. Why is that? Well... It doesn't seem all that bad, right? I mean, it seemed pretty praiseworthy, pretty uplifting. Let's try it again. Luke chapter 1, verse 46. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I mean, how you got a problem with this? This is awesome, right? He has looked with favor on the lowliness of His servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed for the Mighty One has done great things for me and holy is His name. Wonderful. But as you might suspect, that's where we stop reading as Protestants. And she's not done singing. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He filled the hungry with good things and He sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy according to the promise He made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And it doesn't take very long into the last half of the song to realize 
that the reason why this is banned in some places and why we'd rather not dwell on this even in the Protestant church is because if you sit in the seat of the powerful and the full and the healthy and the wealthy, you don't like songs that make you look bad or sermons that sort of undercut the safe and comfortable, stable religious lives that we've built. Mary's song starts the way we expect. It's praiseworthy. I get to bear the Son of God. You, you, I magnify you. And then she says, I'm magnifying the same God that turns away the wealthy and lifts up the poor and fills the hungry belly. And all of the things that we might call charity, she calls God in Luke chapter 1. And by golly, if it doesn't sound a whole lot like what her son about 30 years later will expound on and turn into what's called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And so maybe the revolutionary Jesus who speaks of blessed are the poor and the crushed and the mournful and the hungry who doesn't applaud the halls of wealth and power, maybe that Jesus takes his cue from mom. Maybe he was raised in an atmosphere of God is good and he is especially good to the people no one else is good to. Now, son, that's the kind of God we serve. And so Jesus is raised with that picture of his father. He doesn't have to go out and deconstruct God and then reconstruct God in some compassionate picture after he gets rid of the religious image. He doesn't have to because mom never built that God in his eyes. The song Mom Sings, the Magnificat of Mary that the church probably ought to get back to, maybe a little better than 8% of us having at least read it once a year, because if we paid attention to the words coming out of her mouth before Jesus is even born, we might get a heads up. It isn't going to be what we think it is. The Jesus that is coming is coming. Not on the war path, not on the attack, but we probably could have picked up a few cues. I mean, he's not born in the palaces. He's not born in Rome. He's not born in Jerusalem. He's born in the backwater town village of Bethlehem. Starts his life in a manger, in a stable, probably a cave etched out of the side of a mountain because there was no room for him in the house. That was so unusual that when the wise men show up from the east, they go to the palace of Herod looking for Jesus because that's where kings are born. When they arrive in the palace of Herod, Herod's as shocked as they are. Herod goes, oh, show me. Tell me where this kid is. You know the story. Once they finally find him, they don't walk into the stable and go, oh, forget it. I'm not bowing down at the knees of somebody in a manger. What, what am I signing up for? No. I think they have a revelation. When they walk into that cave, they go, this is it. This is perfect. This is where God would be born. And they give their gifts to that little baby right there because now it makes sense. If you're going to wrap yourself in human flesh in your God and you're going to, be going to become a man, you're going to come down here for the ones that can't take care of themselves, the ones that have been overlooked for so long, the ones that have been crushed. If you're going to establish a kingdom, it can't look like Caesar. Dear God, it can't look like Herod. It's got to look a whole lot more like a shepherd. It's got to look like someone who's at the lowest end of the ladder, the bottom of the totem pole. So when Jesus opens his mouth on the Sermon on the Mount and the first words in the longest recorded public sermon of Jesus is blessed are the poor, you shouldn't be surprised. If you are, I dare say you haven't been paying attention to Jesus. If we make it all the way to Matthew 5 and we missed the how this kid was raised was start in a manger, not work your way to the top of the ladder. Start in a manger and stay right down there. Be a king from the bottom up. And, if, and we've missed it forever because the disciples missed it to the Last Supper when Jesus, John 13, knowing who he was, knowing that all things had been delivered into his hands, rose up and girt about his waist a towel and got on his knees in front of his disciples and washed their feet. Here is the king of glory, realizing that all things have been handed to him. And what does he do with it? He doesn't jump up on a white horse and ride into Rome with a sword in his hand. Instead, he gets down on his knees and he washes feet like the lowliest servant in the house. And when it offends his disciples, and it does, because we are frequently offended by the Jesus of the Gospels, when it offends his disciples, and I dare say, don't think it wouldn't have offended you. I think it would have offended all of us 
king of glory trying to wash my feet. Peter goes, you can't wash my feet, Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, you don't understand how this kingdom works. I don't think you realize what you signed up for. If you're going to be in my kingdom, you're going to wash feet. Peter, I'm going to offend you even more. You're going to wash feet. You see, for a long time, we've read that as, you know, Peter's offended because Jesus is washing his feet. You want to know what's even more offensive? You want to be in ministry? It's not naming lights. It's down on your knees in front of people washing their feet. That's true ministry. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, this is what you're going to do for one another. That should not have surprised anyone in that room. Because if they had paid attention at the Sermon on the Mount, they heard Jesus open with, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the mournful. Blessed are the outsiders and the crushed and the marginalized and the minorities and the people that live on the edges. Blessed are the strangers and the fatherless and the widows. Blessed are the people whose neck is under the boot of the empire. Blessed are those who've been overlooked. You want to know how you should treat them? You want to know how you should live? That's the message he gives. Where does he get it? I think he gets it from mom. I don't think she gets enough credit. And it's probably because, and I'll give you some of my theories. I think it's probably because A, Protestants try to really separate themselves from Catholicism. Catholicism has Mary as a central figure in much of their liturgy. It has Mary as a central figure in much of their prayers. So Protestants try to push away. So anything that even smacks of Mary at all, kind of step away from. So we'll take the parts of Mary that are palatable and we'll get rid of the parts that aren't. Like for instance, it's palatable to magnify God and call yourself a lowly servant. That's what that woman ought to think. She ought to just consider herself blessed to be chosen to bear Jesus. And when we talk about Mary at Christmas time in the Protestant church, the evangelical church, that's how we refer to her. How blessed this woman was to get to carry Jesus. We don't sing the second half of her song where she realized that she was carrying the one who was going to be the ultimate symbol of the revolutionary move of God upon the earth. And... So, so part of it's probably religious, why we sort of push her aside. I think the other part is because the second half of that sermon is not the message of the gospel. Notice how I said that. I paused because I don't believe what I just said. I say it tongue in cheek. I say it because we've made the gospel about missing hell and going to heaven and having good things. That the kingdom is about God giving me favor. You see, when God gives me favor, things work my way. I get that job. I get that raise. No one gets sick. We don't have troubles. If we do have them, we get over them, and then we're better because of them. That's how we preach the gospel. The gospel is, and we say it is for all, but in reality, we think the best iterations of it are the wealthiest iterations of it, the biggest, shiniest, brightest iteration. That's what makes the gospel look good. It can look really good in environments of success. No one wants to applaud the gospel in an environment of loss or filth or poverty. That can't be the gospel at work. That's where the gospel needs to go to work, we say, because that would bring people up out of that if the gospel was with them. In fact, when we preach the gospel of the minority or the poor or the stranger, what we often say is, is if they accepted the gospel, it would bring them up out of their poverty, bring them up out of their issue, bring them up out of their pain, rather than the gospel is Jesus living in their issue and living in their pain and living in their stuff. We don't see the gospel that way. And so it's difficult for us to see gospel whenever we see what Mary sings or what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. That's why... Sometimes art says it better than words can. So I want to show you a picture by an artist named Ben Wildflower. Ben was raised as an evangelical, had a real revelation of the love of God. I don't know his testimony perfectly, but this is his most famous piece of art. I want you to notice the four things that surround this central character. I'm no art appreciation professor, but um, I can appreciate this even without really knowing what I'm doing. First of all, cast down the mighty, lift the lowly, send the rich away, fill the hungry. And the central figure is a woman with her fist in the air and her foot crushing a serpent, both feet crushing a serpent. Interestingly, her foot is even crushing a skull, 
on top of a dead serpent. And so there seems to be a, sort of a lot of Edenic imagery that's going on here, like a Eve 2.0. This time she doesn't fail, but she wins. And the serpent who was going to crush the heel of her seed will have his head crushed. And so the artist puts a skull on top of the serpent. All of that's great imagery, well and good. But notice the words surrounding this. Cast down the mighty, lift the lowly, send the rich away, fill the hungry. When Ben put this out, he received an enormous amount of criticism from his Christian brothers. Because, well, first of all, you can't have a woman crushing the head of the serpent. That's no good. But also, this stuff isn't the gospel, Mr. Wildflower. And you're pitching this as if it's the gospel. And the only real rebuttal he had was to take them to the Magnificat and show them that the four things I chose to frame my woman around are actually the four things that Mary prays in her song of Luke chapter 1. I think one of the great reasons why they struggled with it is because they hadn't bothered to read the second half of the song very much. And also because it just doesn't sound like our version of the gospel. Because it is what Mary prayed. The one who lives in my womb is going to do all of these things. And only in doing these things, only when he casts down the mighty and only when he lifts the lowly and sends the rich away and fills the hunger, in that he crushes the head of the serpent. Because those positions of authority and power that have choked out life from people have to be confronted by the kingdom and have to be confronted by the gospel. And therefore, when Jesus steps onto the mount to deliver the Sermon on the Mount, He's saying all of these things in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And it's why I am not a huge fan of the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, I love it. It's great literature and it's challenging to me. But I'm not a big fan of it because it's not the version of the gospel that I want all the time. You know what I mean? I don't want sermons that tell me how to treat my persecutor or love my enemy. I don't want to talk about my enemy. If I talk about them, I want to talk down about them. That's my right as an American, right? <laughs> I want the gospel my way. I'm okay, I'll admit it. I'm growing. I'm okay struggling with some of the aspects of the Sermon on the Mount that are not palatable to Paul White. And that is why the Father keeps pulling me back to the sermon. Not to save me, but maybe to save me from myself a time or two. And to go, what I want to embrace isn't always exactly what you would have me to embrace. So as long as I keep wrestling with it, then that means that I take it serious. And I don't overlook it. And so... Maybe all I can do is make sure that I'm not crushing the lowly and turning away the hurting. That I'm not embracing riches. It doesn't mean that I askew money. We always try to swing pendulums as hard as we can one way or the other whenever it comes to trying to decipher what the gospel is supposed to say to us rather than just keep wrestling with it. So I think the issue with me, I was going to say with us, but that's not fair. I'm going to say with me, I think the issue with me is that I always want to land on the right answer. So I read like the Sermon on the Mount and I go, okay, then what's the right answer? Then how are we supposed to handle this one and this one and this one and this one? And there's only one right answer. And I think the issue is that this, this, this message is not about landing on the answers. It's about constantly wrestling with that side of us that struggles with that question and that we don't figure we ever nail it. We just continue to live this out in a world where we're going to be the oddball if we take the sermon seriously. That that's the point of that Mount sermon of what Jesus said and why he said it. So with that in mind, with, with the Magnificat in mind, with that last half of it in mind, and with that picture in mind, then go into the Sermon on the Mount. And you hear this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Now we talked about the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We did a lot of that last week and we dwelled on the fact that poor in spirit often causes us to only spiritualize that while that's not entirely accurate coming from the Greek. It doesn't have near as much to do with poverty of spirit, AKA humility as we wish it did, as I wish it did. I wish it was just a scripture about humility because then I could go, all right, I probably, maybe I'm on my way to that. And it's really an opening salvo about blessed are those who get crushed by everybody around them. The kingdom belongs to you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom belongs to them. You want to know what the kingdom is made up of? Those who no one would ever make it. No one would make it up of them. And so Jesus says, welcome in. So it's, it's revolutionary out of the gate. It's not how you start a ministry. It's not how you build a church. And it's vintage Jesus. And he, he might have got it from mama and he's hearing it from daddy. And it's, it's this coming from deep in his soul and coming straight, these two things meeting and, and coming out of Jesus and into us. And then what are we to do with them? Over the course of weeks, we'll work on the Beatitudes. We might even leave and come back to them from time to time. There's a lot to say about each of them. I do want to dwell just a little bit tonight on that second one, that one that is listed in verse 4 there. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I want to remind you of something we said a week ago. These are the often overlooked, forgotten, marginalized, the outsider. They need attention called to them. So Jesus moves them to the front of the line because nobody applauds the mourn, the mourner. The mourner is um, oftentimes considered weak. Um, you don't want to be the one that cries. You want to be the one that makes people cry. You don't want to be the one who's broken. You want to be the one who breaks people. And if you're the mourner, then something went wrong. And we don't, we're not really wanting to embrace oftentimes a gospel in which something has went wrong. But if you've ever had anything go wrong and you've watched the mercy or the grace of God go to work and you're going wrong, you, you don't embrace things going wrong, but you stop fearing it as well. You start to realize pretty quickly that the kingdom goes to work pretty fast where a bunch of stuff goes wrong. And you learn to embrace the moments of your life when mourning is the, is the only thing you know to do. Not because you're depressed or depressive or depressing, but because you know that mourning is the beginning of strength. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. They're the ones who will be comforted. And not only does he start his earthly ministry that way, the text ends in the book of Revelation. Very, very similar to this. Let me show you. Revelation 21.1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, the, Revelation is a book of signs. It's not a book of literalism. It's a book of signification. So we are to read what Revelation says based upon previous information. It would be um, a terrible world to live in with no oceans. If you've ever seen the ocean, you wouldn't want to see the world without it. In fact, once you see it, you'll find ways to take five days off work and go back and see it again, because that's kind of how we are. So Revelation 21, 1, there's a new heaven, a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth pass away and there's no more sea. If you needed any verse in Revelation to at least get you to wrestle with the idea that maybe this book isn't literally, tell, isn't always about literalism, Revelation 21, 1 ought to be it. You at least better hope it isn't literal because you're looking at a new heaven, a new earth where God decided oceans are a bad thing. But in the liturgy of Israel, the sea was that, was that brazen altar that sat right outside the door of the temple. And the water used in that temple was to wash your hands if you were a priest. Priests were the only ones that used it. Was to wash your hands in what was called the brazen sea. You can go back and read this in the Old Testament. The brazen sea washed the blood off of your hands of a sacrifice. The new heaven and the new earth says, there is going to be no more need for you to wash your hands in the brazen sea because you're not killing any more lambs. So this isn't 10,000 years in your future. This is a present possession of a man named Christ Jesus, his heaven in your earth where there is no more sea. There's no more reason for you to wash your hands of, of personal sacrifice. Wash your hands of the blood you have shed of your enemies. Wash your hands of the blood you have shed of your neighbor. 
That's Sermon on the Mount talk, by the way. It's just in its fulfillment in Revelation 21 where it's in its infancy in Matthew chapter 5. Or maybe it's in its second stage in Matthew 5 and it's in its infancy at the Magnificat when Mary says it and prophesies that into the world. Also, seas separate land from land. That's its original intent in the book of Genesis. In the kingdom, there are no groups of people separated from other people. And so there isn't a black church and a white church and a red church and a blue church. There's the church of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is not made up of people's tongue and gender and, speci and specifications. The kingdom of God is universal, thus no, no border-breaking sea. All right? And so there's a fullness in the kingdom that doesn't have the separations that man has. When you start to see the lines of division, it's your first indication that you're seeing evidence of the systems of the world, not the systems of God. So you go into the church and you see lines of division, you've watched the church co-opt the world. She's become influenced by what she's sleeping with. Okay, I know that's bold language, but wherever we start to put up walls in the church and divisions in the church, we're borrowing the ideas of businesses and the systems of darkness because the system of the kingdom doesn't have a C. Right? So there's no more washing off of the blood of your enemies and there's no more divisions between you and your brothers and your sisters. And the kingdom is working to pull those down all the time. So wherever we're building those up in the name of security or in the name of patriotism or in the name of conservatism or liberalism or politics, we need to reconsider what the kingdom actually looks like through the lens of heaven versus through the lens of man. Right? This is why I told you the Sermon on the Mount is revolutionary. This is why I told you it doesn't go down. It, it shouldn't go down smoothly. If it does, you probably need to take another swig. Let's be honest. Because it's, it's speaking to a part of, of, of man's kingdoms being invaded by the kingdoms of God. All of that in verse 1. Okay, I won't do that with every verse, but that was just, that's there, all right? Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The angel asked her, do you want to see the bride? You want to see the bride of Christ? And John said, I, I do want to see the bride of Christ. And this is what he showed him. So we're, again, we're not talking about futuristic cities, I don't think, as much as we're talking about a possession that we have because we're members of the kingdom, because we're a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and, they will be, and he will be their God. Is this in your future or is this your current possession? I want you to think about that because Jesus said that the natural temple was going to be torn down because it was left to men. He said, you can have this natural temple. He said, it's left to you desolate. He said, my father and I are going to make our mansions inside of you. He said, anybody loves my father, my father loves him. My father and I make our house inside of them. Paul picked up that mantle in 1 Corinthians 6 and said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So Paul's revelation post-resurrection was, where's God live? Not in Jerusalem. Paul was so sick by Jerusalem that in Galatians 4, he goes, Jerusalem looks just like Sinai. She's dead with her children. That's, that's revolutionary talk. That's the kind of stuff got Paul's head cut off, by the way. He goes, Jerusalem's dead with her children. He goes, you can have it. He goes, where's the real temple? Inside of you. Where's God live? Inside of you. Where does God dwell? So when you get to Revelation 21 through, quit acting like that's out in the future. Because if that's out in the future, God's tabernacle is not on the earth with us. We're not talking about a temple made out of concrete and marble someday after we repossess national Israel and build a trillion dollar temple so God can live in it. For, for Pete's sake, why would God want to move out of the church so he could move into a temple on a piece of property on planet earth? When the reality is that he already has a temple called his church. I'm going to dwell with them. They're going to be my people. God's going to be with them. God's going to be their God. And look what happens when this becomes reality. And I said when this, I should have said it this way. Look what happens when this becomes your reality. Because this, you're the bride, right? This isn't you talking about a future church. If it is, just close it up. Because it's really not relevant for you. It's relevant for a church 10 generations from you. But if it's relevant for you, look what happens when you get it. Verse 4. God's going to wipe every tear away from their eyes. And there's going to be no more death or sorrow or crying and no more pain because the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are true and these words are faithful. 
These words aren't future. These words are true. And these words are faithful. And guess what happens when he takes up residence in you? Death loses. And wherever you mourn, blessed are the mourn, for they should be comforted. When? When God moves in. So when Jesus gives beatitude number two, it's a prophetic statement. It's a promise. You know what the kingdom looks like? All of those of you who hurt, all of those of you who cry, all of those of you who have been beaten down, you're blessed. You shall be comforted. Why? Because the king's going to take up residence in your neighborhood. And when the king moves into your neighborhood, everything goes up. I don't like it sometimes when I hear, when I hear it come out of Jesus' mouth in the sermon, I go, ooh, I got to wrestle with these. But when I can see it fulfilled in Christ in me, I can embrace it. I say all that for this reason. So no, no matter how unpalatable some portions of this message are going to get, just remember your possession, your inheritance. Because as we embrace that inheritance, those portions can begin to work out in us through the grace of God. Because the Sermon on the Mount is not a return to the performance of the Old Covenant. It's the end result of God living on the earth through His church. It's the fruit that comes out of His church because of the grace of a resurrected Christ. And so we can rejoice in these moments. Because, why? Because behold, I make all things new. And that's the work that He's doing and it's why He's doing it is to create in us that newness. Let's go back to that sermon. Matthew 5. Starting in verse 5, I'm not going to do with each one of those what I just did with more, and we're going to work on those a little bit every week, okay? Because I know that you know me, and we'll be here way too long if I try to do that with every one of them. So tonight was, was, is the Magnificat on the Mount, because I think that what Jesus is doing is what his mom did. He's just doing it through what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And if we could pay attention to what she did, we might have a better understanding of what he's trying to do. And then what is he trying to do? Well, he's saying stuff like this. Blessed are the meek, they're going to inherit the earth. Blessed are the hunger and thirst for righteousness. I think a better word there is justice. They're the same word in the Greek. Blessed are people who hunger and thirst for justice. They're going to get their fill of justice. Justice is coming. That's part of the kingdom. Seven, blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Nine, and we'll work on these over and over and over. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 11. Blessed are you. Look at this. He turns to his crowd. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. Guess what, disciples? This is what's going to happen to you if you do this. They're going to revile you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's a toughie, right? Have you ever thought about how tough 12 is on the backside of 11? Things aren't going my way. People are making fun of me. The evil people hate me. Nothing's going for me. What do I do? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And we go, that's impossible. That's pie in the sky. You're not going to be rejoicing and be exceedingly glad after people do all this to you. That's one of our first indications. We've got a long way to go with this sermon. That's Jesus. And remember, he said, I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to take up residence in you. It's okay. I'm going to take up residence in you. We're going to work this out together. But don't act like this ain't a big deal. Don't act like this sermon don't apply to you. Don't act like, oh, that's all old covenant. I don't need that. You're standing in front of grace and truth. And he's talking to you about the kingdom to come. And so it's the kingdom to come. And he goes, this is what it's going to look like when it gets here. You'll probably miss it because you're not going to expect it. You're going to look for it in the wrong resident. You're going to look for it in the wrong subdivision. That might be how, that's how he would say it, I think, if he came today. He goes, the kingdom is going to look like this and this and this and this. And be careful because you'll miss it because you'll be looking in the wrong subdivision because I promise you it won't be where you think it is. But that's okay, he goes, because together we're going to live this out. You're going to, and when they turn on you, because they will, because bless God, if you present that kind of kingdom, you're not always going to be popular because that ain't easy living, man. And I'm going to tell you who's going to give you the most trouble for it. The church. Trust me. I, know. <laughs> I had a guy call me this week, a good brother in the faith, and he had, he'd been preaching... He'd been preaching a fulfilled eschatology, the kingdom of God. God wants to manifest the kingdom in you. And he called me and he goes, hey, man, is it, is it normal that my, that my friends are abandoning me and that people are starting to send me nasty emails and things are getting rough? And I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that it's just getting started. 
said, I can give you a couple other things you're probably going to walk into in the next year that's going to get worse before it gets better. As I said, it ain't, it ain't always easy to proclaim and herald the kingdom of God because the kingdom don't look like people think it looks. And when you start to get that revelation and you start to share that, it's not a matter of being combative. It's not a matter of trying to get people to see things differently. But as you proclaim that, Jesus, get in line, man. Jesus told you it's going to happen to you, he said, because it happened to me. So I didn't meet the expectations. You're not going to meet the expectations. So that's okay. We'll walk this out together. You're going to be blessed. They're going to revile and persecute you, but there's a blessing in that. Blissful are those of you who are reviled and persecuted. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Great your reward in heaven. For so the persecuted they, the prophets, who were before you. Um, let's give me that next phrase because I want to set up our final thought with this. Jesus' beatitudes not only highlight those who are trampled and overlooked, and man, do they ever promising them prominence in the kingdom. But his beatitudes also assume that the hearer will believe in them to the point of persecution. That's what he assumes. You guys are going to take me serious and you're going to believe in these to the point that you'll live them out. And when you live them out, I promise you, you will be persecuted, reviled, and spoken evil of. Otherwise, why would he throw that in? He didn't throw that in on the backside of if you tell people they're going to hell, you're going to get persecuted. No. He said, if you go down into hell and lift up the people that are there, you're going to get persecuted. Because if you call that the kingdom, they're going to turn on you. Because they don't want the kingdom to look like that. He said, the moment you call that the kingdom, get ready. It's going to get tough. That's okay. Because they're going to do it to me first, and you're going to feel honored to have them do it to you. So you're going to watch it happen in your king. This is why you keep your eyes on the cross and the resurrection. This is why it's the central piece of, of Christianity. Heaven is not the center. Man, we've messed this up. Going to heaven is not the centerpiece of Christianity. The cross and the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus is the centerpiece of Christianity. That gets you through. Not I get to go to heaven when I die. No, I get to go where Jesus goes. That's what drives me forward. If they put me on a cross, all they can do is bury me and he can resurrect me. I, my hope is in him. It's founded in him. The kingdom is built on him. And so it assumes that you'll take it serious and that you'll be persecuted. But that assumption then manifests itself as salt and light of the world. Here's the unfortunate darkness. You cannot be salt and light apart from the Beatitudes. Because look where they fall. Watch this. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Great your reward in heaven for so persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's 12. Look at 13. You are the salt of the earth. It's the next verse. What's he saying? You want to know what salt looks like? Persecuted people. Okay? So right on the back side of rejoice, you know that you're persecuted. Why? Why should you rejoice? Because you're the salt of the earth. If you lose your flavor, how can anything be seasoned? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. The flavor of kingdom discipleship is the Beatitudes. That's the flavor. That's what it smells like. That's what it tastes like. That's what it looks like. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. As you live this out, things won't always go easy. It's okay. I'll live in you. You live in me. We'll take up residence together. That'll make you the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. 15. Nor do they light a lamp, put it under a basket. They put it on a lampstand. It gives light to everybody that's in the house. Look, this is going to work. You'll be the light. When? In these beatitudes, that's what the light looks like. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. End game, dad gets the glory. Meantime, good works touch the world. Salt, light, the world gravitates. The world gravitates to the kingdom because they're tired of everything else that's trampled them down. This is why a lot of your opposition will come from within the church because we've substituted the message of the gospel with other things of which the Sermon on the Mount bumps up to time and time again, chapter five, chapter six, chapter seven, until you finally get to the end of it and you go, just come down off that mountain, Jesus. And you do. In fact, I was thinking about this today. You know how we read those first three or four verses of Mary's Magnificat and you go like, ooh, good song, beautiful. Why would anybody dislike that? We should be singing that all the time. And then you sing the last few verses and you go, mm, I don't know if that's the gospel I was saved into. I was thinking about that today. You get to the end of chapter, Matthew chapter 4 and the Bible says that Jesus went about and he healed the sick and he touched the blind and he cast out devils. And chapter 4 ends. And you go, wow, 
that's the guy I want to follow. And then chapter five says, and he walked up the mountain and he opened his mouth and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And you go, ah, if you'd have just stayed down there healing people and casting out devils, you could have changed the world, but you had to go up there and start preaching. Don't ever forget the gospel is the doctrine of that. I, I heard someone today say, oh, we need kindness, but we need doctrine with our kindness. And I thought, dear God, help us. Kindness is our doctrine. We don't need kindness and doctrine. What, what is the doctrine without the kindness of the Spirit? They don't, it's not as if they're two things that have to be counterbalanced out. Like some of you people are being too kind. We need the doctrines of the church because the doctrines of the church obviously aren't kind. Otherwise, we wouldn't brag about needing more of them to balance this out. The reality is the kindness is the doctrine. That it's all a part of this. This is why Jesus says, when you're salt, when you're light, this is what it'll look like. And, and I'll admit, I just wish he'd stay in the valley and heal people and cast out devils. Don't walk up that mountain. Because the great challenge of Christianity, and this is just true. If you follow me, he said, you'll pick up your cross daily and follow me. And where do you go with a cross? Always up a hill. They don't crucify him in the valley. They crucify him up high so everybody can see. So he says, if you carry a cross, you're going to go up a hill. My point with that is this. You're going to have to go up that hill with Jesus. You better get used to the Sermon on the Mount. It's your constitution. I don't know who said this, so I can't give him credit, but I heard it. It's a good place to stop. He said, Christianity is more than the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount but it is never less. That's true. It is never less than those. Oh, it's more than that, but it's never less than that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You do a work that we can't do, and I thank you for it. I thank you that every time I come into this encounter on the Mount, I'm challenged again I'm encouraged. I have to see you in me, me in you, so that I know you're going to bring these things out in me. But I thank you that we get to be salt and we get to be light in the earth. And wherever we set our foot, we get to be agents of the kingdom. Teach us what that looks like. Thank you for this magnificat, this magnify of Mary in this season especially, as we think about your advent. May we think about what that Advent meant then and what it should mean now. In Jesus' name, amen.